Well, good morning, everyone, and uh, what a Sunday. Had some beautiful rain yesterday for our gardens and our trees and stuff, and this morning, John's baptism, uh, several birthdays. Uh, it is good to be in the house of the Lord to worship together, uh, but we are always thinking about those who can't be with us and, and praying for those, and, and we understand the difficulties uh, with the underlying health conditions and corona and all the things. Uh, so we'll continue to stream Facebook Live for those that can't be with us in person. Uh, this morning we're again in the pastoral epistles of the Apostle Paul. And we are working our way verse by verse through First and Second Timothy and Titus. Uh, we're currently in First uh, Timothy and we're going to look at chapter 3. And, and what we realize as we uh, have already begun that study is that the Apostle is talking about the qualifications for men and women in the church. And this being Father's Day, it's appropriate that we are in that section that is dealing uh, with men in the church. Uh, this morning we'll be looking uh, at the qualifications of deacons. Last Sunday it was the qualifications for uh, the overseers, the pastors of the church. And so uh, we're going to turn to 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 8 in just a moment. Uh, but another word of prayer before uh, we begin the sermon. Uh, Father, we are together preparing to open the word of life. And it's my prayer as the pastor of this church, the preaching pastor, uh, that we would with all reverence take to heart uh, what it is that we take from that word of life, that we be workmen rightly dividing uh, the truth of that word, uh, and that we would, as James say, uh, said, be doers and not hearers only of that word. So, Father, prepare our hearts to hear that word, uh, prepare our souls uh, to be lifted up and built up by the power of the gospel working within us. Uh, and then, Father, help us to consider how it is uh, that the ministry of the church happens uh, through those men that we set aside uh, called deacons. And Father, we pray this for your glory, and please now, Lord God, move in the ways only you can. Amen and amen. So 1 Timothy uh, chapter 3, beginning in, in verse 8 this morning. Uh, the apostle writes, Deacons, likewise, must be dignified, not double-tongued, not addicted to much wine, not greedy for dishonest gain. They must hold the mystery of the faith with a clear conscience. And let them also be tested first, and then let them serve as deacons if they prove themselves blameless. Their wives likewise must be dignified, not slanderers, but sober-minded, faithful in all things. And let deacons each be the husband of one wife, managing their children and their own households well. For those who serve well as deacons gain a good standing for themselves and also great confidence in the faith that is in Christ Jesus. So that's the Apostle Paul's word uh, for those in the church that we call deacons. Uh, we just looked at his qualifications for the overseers, the pastors or elders of the church. Uh, and just like that, he says likewise here, just like the, the pastors, the deacons must, he says, they, they must. This isn't a good suggestion, but this is a command from God. Uh, and then what must the deacons do? Well, the apostle is going to list nine qualities, that, that the qualifications that deacons must possess. Uh, and, and those qualifications are a lot along the same lines as the overseers. But there are some slight nuances and some slight differences uh, because the office and work of the deacon is a little bit different than the office and work of the overseers. Now, there's a lot of overlap, of course. Uh, and it doesn't mean that a deacon can't do pastoral work. And in fact, a lot of what deacons do is pastoral work. Uh, but the primary difference that I see from this section of Scripture uh, between deacons and pastors is pastors are called to pray and teach and reach and deacons are called to minister to the church uh, to hold it together and to keep the families uh, moving forward and all that stuff so there's no stipulation uh, other than they have a good re report with, the, with their community there's no stipulation that deacons be able to do the outreach into the community now uh, I want to say right off the bat that doesn't mean you shouldn't 
and praise God for the deacons we have in this church who are out there reaching the community. That That's awesome. And we're going to see, uh, even from the New Testament, example uh, of a deacon that did just that in, in his own life. Um, before we uh, jump any further, uh, I want to say also that there is not one case in the whole of scriptures where a deacon is shown as ruling the church. That is not their office. It is not what they do. Uh, but I have been in churches and we have heard of churches where there are deacon boards uh, that, that rule over the church. They're the final authority in any local church. Uh, they have uh, total control of the operation of the church. They hire and they fire the pastor and all sorts of things like that. Well, uh, I just want to tell you that something along those lines is in violation of the scriptures. That There's a complete lack of understanding as to the actual role of a deacon in a local church. Uh, and what's happening in a lot of those cases, it isn't del perhaps deliberate it's not like, oh, we're just going to set aside the Bible and do our own thing. Rather, it's that the, the deacons have kind of taken on for themselves the role of elders in the church. But you see, there are different words for that in the New Testament and different offices for that in the New Testament. Uh, in fact, the Apostle Paul, uh, in another letter to the, the people of Philippi, the Philippians, uh, he wrote in, in verse 1, uh, chapter 1, verse 1, he said, Paul and Timothy, servants of Christ Jesus, to all the saints in Christ Jesus who are at Philippi, with who? With the overseers and deacons. You see how he calls each one of those two roles out over top of all the saints? And then he says, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. If overseers were deacons and deacons were overseers, then for the apostle to write that to the church, it would be kind of weird. It would be kind of out of place. Uh, but he says that these are different offices and he lists different qualifications, both here and then later we'll see the same thing again in Titus when we get to that point. Uh, and by the way, he calls the whole church saints. He calls all the believers who are born again and baptized saints. Uh, that just raises one simple little question this morning. Are you a saint? According to God you are, but are you living like a saint? You know, the, I'm going to leave that on the table. That's not today's sermon, but I just want to throw it in because that's what preachers do, right? <laughs> uh, enlisting all these qualifications for deacons. Uh, the Apostle is building on the original qualifications, on the original institution of deacons in the New Testament. Uh, when the New Testament church began in the book of Acts, and that's the history that details all that, uh, we find in chapter 6... Uh, the church ran into a problem, and they had need of people to come alongside uh, the apostles, who were at that time the elders of the church. And so I want to just turn back to Acts chapter 6, and, and I know we studied through this when we preached all the way through the book of Acts, but I just want to review this, this section and, and get a little taste for, for what it is that the deacons were originally instituted to do in the local church. So Acts chapter 6, verse 1. Now in these days, when the disciples were increasing in number, in other words, the, the church members, right? When they were increasing in number, a complaint by the Hellenists, that are the, those are the Greeks, arose against the Hebrews, those are the people from, from Jewish people from Israel, uh, because the widows, the Greek widows, were being neglected in the daily distribution. And the twelve summoned the full number of the disciples and said, It is not right that we should give up preaching the word of God to serve tables. Therefore, brothers, pick out from among you seven good men of good repute and full of the spirit and of wisdom whom we will appoint to this duty. But we will devote ourselves to prayer and to the ministry of the word. And what they said, that's, that's the apostles again, the elders of that church, what they said pleased the whole gathering, and they chose Stephen, a man full of uh, faith and of the Holy Spirit, and Philip, and Prochorus, and Nicanor, and Timon, and Param, uh, Paramenus, and Nicholas, a proselyte of Antioch. And these they set before the apostles, and they prayed and laid their hands on them. In other words, they were ordained into the ministry. And the word of God continued to increase. Hear that? And the number of disciples multiplied greatly in Jerusalem, and a great many of the priests became obedient to the faith. 
So what's happening here is as the church begins functioning better and taking care of their people, all of their people, not just the select few uh, really important ones, uh, that the church began to really grow. And what's happened here is the elders, uh, who were in fact at this point in the very early church, uh, the original apostles of Christ, uh, they needed to busy themselves with praying and preaching and teaching and uh, call, <coughs> excuse me, call other faithful men uh, to come alongside them, not to serve them, that's never what's said, never, never to serve the pastors, but to serve the flock, to serve the church. Uh, and so they're to serve the saints. And they called these servants diakonos in the Greek, uh, and that word means servants. Uh, but it's a servanthood of humility and a servanthood of worth. It, it's not the sort of servanthood uh, like the word doulos when we, when we mean in, instead slavery. This isn't a slavery. This is a willing service to the body of Christ in order to help build it up. Now these days, uh, the order of how that all happens, uh, you know, deacons taking care of the ministry in the church and pastors teaching and preaching the word, reaching outsiders, is often twisted around. Uh, the pastor is the one that is expected to make all the, the health visits and hospital visits and take care of everybody's you know stuff here and there, set up for everything for church. And the deacons run around managing the building and taking you know doing other kind of stuff. It's almost it's almost like we flip the order that the Bible lists here in the Book of Acts and, and are doing it the opposite way. You know, the pastor is the guy running around doing all the work that deacons, according to the Word of God, should be doing. Uh, so I think that what we want to do is we want to consider the biblical example and follow that because I believe with all my heart that if we follow the biblical example that God will grow his church. Uh, we, we see that lived out in the book of Acts over and over uh, as they did church God's way, the church grew. And even some of the most difficult people in their community, when it says a great many of the priests became obedient to the faith, it's talking about Jewish priests who were rabbis in the temple uh, that came to know the Lord Jesus Christ because of the efforts uh, of both the apostles, uh, the elders of this church, and the deacons, as we're going to see in, in a minute. Well, moving back to, to 1 Timothy, uh, I want us to take a look at the qualifications. Uh, and some of these qualifications dovetail with the qualifications for elders. So I'm not going to explain every single one because we kind of already uh, had that last week and we have a little bit of a, an understanding. But there are a couple of qualifications here uh, that are really important to the work of a deacon in the church. Uh, for instance, Paul says that the deacons must be dignified and not double-tongued and not addicted to much wine, not greedy for dishonest gain. Uh, like the overseers or the pastors, uh, deacons need to be men with the right attributes for the job. They need to have the right qualification. And one of the qualifications to be a deacon in the local church is that one ought not be a hothead. Now we all know what hotheads are. It's, it's that guy, that girl, whatever, that wants to argue with everybody about everything. And, and, and it says these, these have to be dignified and not double-tongued. They don't have to be talking about somebody behind their back. They don't have to be spreading slander and gossip and rumor. Uh, these ought to be the kind of men that the church can trust because they've been put into an assigned role of caring for the families in the church. Uh, it's the deacons that, that people should turn to first for family care, and I, I believe that's, that's God's uh, way. Uh, as this passage in Acts that we read in first, uh, deacons have to be very active in the daily life of the church. They were assigned to take care of the widows and orphans, to distribute the table, you know, to help people live and doing all that stuff. And one of the assigned roles for our brother deacons here at Mapledale, apart from taking care of the building and grounds, which they do magnificently, is that they also handle the benevolence ministry of this church. Uh, when somebody comes to the church and they have some need, uh, I, I point them to the deacons and, and they will confer about that need and, and see if there's a way that we can meet that need. Uh, they may come and talk to me, I may come and talk to them, we, we go back and forth. But ultimately it's the deacons that make the decision as to whether or not we are going to offer some level of help to someone uh, who comes to us for help. Um, that is exactly 
what the, the book of Acts chapter 6 uh, says is one of the duties of the deacons. Uh, we remember that uh, the, the widows were being neglected in the daily distribution. That's benevolence. And so deacons are to do that. Um, this preference uh, that, that deacons are actually servants of the church uh, is, is kind of enumerates for them the fact that these need to be men who are ultimately extremely fair, who bring healing and godliness and, and, and love into the ministry of the church in order to see the whole ministry of the church uh, grow and, and be doubled in their efforts. Uh, one of the assigned uh, roles here, uh, other than, than the benevolence and the maintenance, uh, is also setting up the table of the Lord, which Dan does every Sunday. He takes care of that, and, and we do a lot of other outreaches. Now, I believe that the apostle laid out all these responsibilities, uh, uh, thinking in, in his mind about the widows and, and those that were part of the church. Uh, Acts chapter 1 mentioned the widows right away in verse 1, that, you know, that they were the ones that were having a struggle. And, and later on, the apostle in this same letter of 1 Timothy is going to go on and, and he's going to talk about uh, widows. And in fact, we can look at that for just a moment. We've looked at this a little bit already. Uh, if we skip ahead to 1 Timothy chapter 5 verse 9, uh, what we see there is the qualifications for the church to actually help a widow. Did you know there were such things? Look at this. Let a widow be enrolled if she is not less than 60 years of age, having been the wife of one husband, same qualification as the deacon and the pastor, right? And having a reputation for good works. If she has brought up children, has shown hospitality, has washed the feet of the saints, has cared for the afflicted, and has devoted herself to every good work. So those are the widows that are supposed to be enrolled into the ministry of the deacons to be cared for. Now, I don't want to single out anybody in particular, but we just ask for prayer for, for Grace Semsch. Grace has lived out this qualification of a widow, and, and others have too. I'm not, again, not trying to single anybody out, but she is a classic example of somebody who's qualified for our deacons to come alongside and help. Uh, the whole idea surrounding helping those in need is we help the ones who have already extended their own ability to help themselves to the limit. And then after that, we turn around and start considering other help to the church. Uh, in that same passage in 1 Timothy 5, chapter, 8, uh, chapter 5, verse 8, uh, the apostle writes, But if anyone does not provide for his relatives, and especially for members of his household, he has denied the faith and is worse than an unbeliever. And so those people that just come to the door of the church with their hand out and they haven't even tried to provide for their families are not exactly the ones that uh, we have to take care of. Now we might take care of them depending on the need, but that's why our, our brother deacons with wisdom come alongside. Uh, the apostle says uh, that deacons need to be people of high character with godly wisdom in order to sort out all those problems. And what they need to do as they're sorting out all those problems, especially handling the treasury of the church, so to speak, is they have to be not greedy for dishonest gain, the apostle said. They, they have to be doing these ministries without looking out for how they might profit from it. Now, it, it's really easy, I think, when people start handling uh, wealth and everything to become lovers of money rather than lovers of God. We see that even among the original 12 apostles, Judas was their treasurer, and, and he ultimately loved that treasury bag that he carried around much more than he loved the Savior who he was walking next to. Uh, I've seen in, in my life uh, in, in church work uh, how deacons uh, might be lovers of, of wealth or in it for dishonest gain. Uh, there is always one deacon in every church that is counting every penny for everyone else's needs, but never considers uh, the, the fact that he is justifying his own needs. And so whatever his thing is, there's always money for that, but there's never any money for any, but anything else. Uh, there's, there's the deacon who is extravagant with other people's money, uh, including the church's money, which is in fact all of the saints' gifts and offerings uh, that, that are given for godly uses, right? Uh, there's the deacon who always seeks to get some personal gain uh, from their ministry to the church. Uh, and then and those are who, there are people who give to the church, not just deacons, but everybody, who give to the church, and then they take back when they get unhappy with the church. 
And, you know, Kathy and I were just visiting the, the church at Lac de Flambeau, and, and I'm not trying to be a gossip or anything, but that church literally exploded from the inside out uh, because they got upset about some things, and people over the years that had given things to the church came back in the church and took all those things and left with them. The sound system, the piano, the, I mean, they cleaned out the church. Every Bible they gave, everything. They weren't giving to God, they were giving to make themselves look good. And that's not why we give to the church. Uh, they had left the church in shambles, and, and they're still trying to catch up from that, and I think they got a way to go. Uh, the point here is, is, is that a deacon needs to be someone with integrity. He needs to be someone of, with integrity, and he needs to devote his life to service of God, uh, not just making a good name for himself. Uh, Paul goes on in, in chapter 3, uh, verse 8, he says, uh, Deacons are not double-tongued. They're not addicted to much wine. Now, again, double-tongued means you say one thing to one guy and you say another thing to another guy in order to move all the parts around. And, and we've all seen that problem. It happens. It's not pretty. Uh, sooner or later, the truth comes out, and it's like, oh, well, uh, how did you find out? Well, because people talk. <laughs> How do you find out? We always find out. Sooner or later, the truth finds out. You know, what did Jesus say about that? Uh, if you turn to Matthew 5.33, Jesus had some things to say about uh, the way we should speak with each other and speak of God. Matthew 5.33, uh, he said again, You have heard that it was said to those of old, You shall not swear falsely, but shall perform to the Lord what you have sworn. But I say to you, do not take an oath at all, either by heaven, for it is the throne of God, or by earth, for it is his footstool, or by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king. And do not take an oath by your head, for you cannot make one hair white or black. Let what you say simply be yes or no. Anything more than this comes from evil. Well, that's the antidote for doublespeak. James, the brother of Jesus, had some things to say about that, and uh, he was the, the, the elder of the church at Jerusalem, he was the overseer, James 1.26, he says, if anyone thinks he's religious, and does not bridle his tongue, but deceives his heart, this person's religion is worthless. Religion that is pure and undefiled before God the Father is this, to visit orphans and widows in their affliction, and to keep oneself unstained from the world. And the whole idea here is, is that our overseers and our deacons both need to be men of integrity and trustworthiness. Uh, if you can't trust your deacons and you can't trust your pastor, then you probably should find another church to attend somewhere where you can trust them. The problem is it's difficult because we're all human beings. Now the apostle used that same phrase with the deacons he did with the elders, uh, not addicted to much wine, and again uh, that doesn't mean that, that they have to be a teetotaler, but it certainly means that the deacon should not be a guy that, that can turn on the bar sign at 9 o'clock at night. Just imagine, you know, if your role as, as an official ordained deacon in the church is to be available to help the members of the church, uh, and one of those members gives you a call at 9 o'clock at night, uh, and you are stumbling to be able to answer the phone because you're making a night of it, then what does that say about you and the church and everything else? You know, it, it just does not represent well the kingdom uh, of God and our Savior. Uh, one of the next qualifications uh, that, that Paul writes, and, and it's a little bit of a mystery why he writes this, but maybe we'll figure that out in a moment here. He says, they must hold the mystery of the faith with a clear conscience. They must hold the mystery of the faith with a clear conscience. Now, uh, again, it seems a little bit weird. Why didn't the apostle just say they have to live the gospel? I mean, that's, that's clear, that's plain, right? Just live the gospel and, and all will be well. Well, the, the fact is, is that the gospel, while being central and critical to our life in Christ, is not the whole counsel of the whole word of God. And deacons being those ministers to the people in the church, the, the families, the widows, the orphans, etc., have to be able to live on the whole counsel of the Word of God, which is, I believe, why the Apostle says the mystery of the faith. You have to know the Word from beginning to end and understand how it's put together and how it works and how to apply the mysteries 
uh, of the fact that God is sovereign and his Holy Spirit works in the world and he brings healing and comforting and, and providence. You have to understand the whole of that, not just that little part uh, in the center of that that is the cross and the resurrection. If the gospel is all someone knows, then how do you minister to someone in the church who is already in that gospel? You see, and that's the problem. Uh, we've already mentioned caring for the widows earlier, and, and according to the apostle, these widows that are qualified to be cared for are those who have already proven themselves faithful to the gospel. Uh, they are faithful saints in the church. And so the deacon ministry to them has to go over and above just coming to them and telling them once again that Jesus died and rose again from the dead for you. Uh, and again, I'm not discounting the importance of the gospel, not at all. Without that, we can't even live or breathe. But the ministry to the saints and to the church encompasses so much more than that. Uh, you have to know the law of God, the providence of God, uh, the striving that we all have for the kingdom of God, the rules of biblical hospitality, uh, the fact that we are a royal priesthood and that we are all called uh, to meet these issues uh, surrounding us with marriage and family and so on and so forth. And then there are all the added life issues that come on, you know, should I take this job or that job or uh, should I make this financial decision or, or, or what happens when we're in sorrow because uh, we've just lost a dear loved one or something along those lines. All of those things go beyond the, the simple scope of the gospel. They include the gospel, uh, but there's a lot of other wisdom in the scriptures that, that uh, have, to, have to be dealt with. So the primary qualification of a deacon, I would say then, is that they have to know and they have to live the whole Bible with a clear conscience. That, that's who these men need to be. And that's not a job for novices. It's, it's not a job for those who have no concern with biblical things. And it's not a job for those men who are unteachable. They, they simply think that they've arrived and no longer need Bible education of any sort. Those earliest deacons from Acts chapter 6 were sitting under the teaching of the apostles, and from that teaching they went out and, and helped change their world. They helped change their church. And the church just literally exploded in growth because everything was working the way God intended. Do our deacons here at Mapledale all have a good conscience about their Bible education? Are you availing yourself? Uh, only the deacons here can answer that question, but I think it's a question of critical importance. Uh, no one has arrived, not this pastor, not the best preachers and theologians in the world. Every single one of us needs to come under the Word of God every single day and apply that to our lives. Uh, what was it that Jesus said? Uh, I'm trying to tell you, yeah, that's right, Matthew chapter 28, 18. Go into all the world and make disciples, right? Those who are learners. And then he went on to say, baptize them, as we did with Brother John this morning. And then he said, teach them to observe all the things uh, that I have, uh, have ordered you. And so deacons need to do that. They need to be qualified to act in a lot of roles. Uh, 1 Timothy 3.10 let them also be tested first, then let them serve as deacons if they prove themselves blameless. So you want to observe these men and see if they're living that life. And then he turns in verse 11, it's not just about men, this is Father's Day, but this is not just about men. What does he say? Their wives likewise must be dignified, not slanderers, but sober-minded, faithful in all things. Uh, so the wives have to look like the widows, that were just described in Timothy, 1 Timothy chapter 5. They have to be godly saints in the church. Uh, and so he's, he's not just picking on the men. Uh, in verse 13 he says, Those who serve well as deacons gain a good standing for themselves and also great confidence in the faith that is in Christ Jesus. So with all these conditions we begin to get a picture of what it is that God demands for those who serve him, whether pastors and overseers or deacons. Uh, and I think that's exactly what the apostle is trying to show here in these teachings. These are called the pastoral epistles because they teach us how to do church well. 
Uh, it's not just about the men, it's about the entire family structure. Uh, and a deacon must first be a family minister in his own family before he can be a family minister to other families. And so this teaching by the Apostle Paul uh, means that these men have to have integrity uh, above the norm and, and qualifications above the average. Now, it does not, again, mean that deacons must be married. But it means that they must live their married life uh, as an exemplary married life. Uh, they ought not have bad habits. When people look at our deacons, when they look at our pastors, our elders, they ought to look and say, that is how a man of God should be living. Now, from time to time, people accuse me of not living like a man of God because I might say something that upsets them, and they think that a man of God should never upset anybody. That's not true. I can't find that in the Bible. If you're not upset by the Bible once in a while, you're probably not reading it. Anyway, Acts chapter 6. Uh, again, I, I want to conclude what we're talking about in deacons this morning uh, with the example in Scripture uh, that we have of one of these first deacons. Um, Acts Act chapter 6, beginning in verse 8, and we're going to kind of wrap up with this story. And Stephen, he was one of those seven named, full of grace and power, do you see that? Full of grace and power, was doing great wonders and signs among the people. And then some of those who belonged to the synagogue of the freedmen, as it was called, and of the Cyrenians and of the Alexandrians and those from Cilicia and, and Asia, rose up and disputed with Stephen. They didn't like what he was doing, right? But they could not withstand the wisdom and the spirit with which he was speaking. See, he sat under the apostles' teaching and he absorbed it and, and what he learned from them about Christ and about the Bible, he turned around and put right back at them. Verse 11, they secretly instigated men who said, we have heard him speak blasphemous words against Moses and God. That's what I was just saying. People don't always like what I say. And they stirred up the people and the elders and the scribes, and they came upon him and seized him and brought him before the council, and they set up false witnesses who said, this man never ceases to speak words against this holy place and the law. For we have heard him say that this Jesus of Nazareth will destroy this place and will change Changed the custom that Moses delivered to us. And gazing at him, all those who sat in the council saw that his face was like the face of an angel. Well, when they're accusing him of saying that Jesus was going to destroy the temple and that Jesus was going to upset all the stuff, the customs that Moses gave to him, of course he was sitting there with a face like an angel because all of that was true. That's exactly what was happening. But he was the first deacon in history to come up against this, these powerful adversaries in the church. Uh, and what he goes on to describe is ultimately going to cost this deacon his life. He would stand before this mighty council of the Sanhedrin of the Jews and in uh, one of the most succinct and beautiful uh, uh, summarize, uh, summarizing statements of the whole salvation history of God he lays out for them the history of God and God's people coming right up to the Savior, Jesus Christ. And the fact that he could do that so succinctly and so beautifully on the spot under pressure meant that he was exactly the kind of deacon that meets the qualifications that the apostle is talking about. Look at Acts 7.51 with me. Acts 7.51. He says, uh, he's saying this to the council now, these powerful people, right? You stiff-necked people, uncircumcised in heart and ears, you always resist the Holy Spirit as your fathers did, so do you. Which of the prophets did your fathers not persecute? And they killed those who announced beforehand the coming of the righteous one, whom you now have betrayed and murdered. You who received the laws delivered by angels did not keep it. And now when they heard those things, they were enraged and they ground their teeth at him. But he, this is Stephen again, full of the Holy Spirit, gazed into heaven and saw the glory of God in Jesus standing at the right hand of God. And he said, Behold, I see the heavens open and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. Do you want to see that vision? I want to see that vision. But what do they do? 
Verse 57, they cried out with a loud voice and stopped their ears and rushed together at him. And then they cast him out of the city and stoned him. And the witnesses laid down their garments at the feet of a young man named Saul. And as they were stoning Stephen, he called out, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. And falling to his knees, he cried out with a loud voice, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. And when he said this, he fell asleep. In other words, he died. They stoned this deacon to death for preaching the gospel. Brother Todd, you guys are down at the park. You preach the gospel. Let God figure it out. Amen. We pray that we don't come against that sort of persecution in our own life. But if it comes our way, the response has to be the same. We preach Christ and Him crucified and rose again from the dead on the third day, and we preach the whole counsel of the Word of God. Stephen was 100% in his faith and in his responsibility and his integrity, and he passed the test for prime qualifications of deacons as recorded by the Scriptures of God. And he spoke the truth of God in love. He had no hateful vengeance in his voice, except for he called them stiff-necked, uncircumcised people. <laughs> Further and rather ironically, the one who held the cloaks of all the ones who stoned this first deacon, his name is Saul, is the very same author that wrote this letter about the qualifications of deacons that we're now studying. Now I want you to think about that for a minute. He saw firsthand the one who was perhaps the preeminent deacon in the whole history of deacons in the world, who represented the faith of God and saw a vision of Christ, he held the cloaks of them who killed that man. He knows what a good deacon looks like. And I can't know this for sure, but I have to imagine in his mind as he's writing these words, now a converted man, a man who has been exposed to that life-changing gospel himself, saved by, by the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ, as he's writing these words about the qualifications of a deacon, he has to be thinking, I remember Stephen. And that's what a deacon should look like. My brothers and sisters, it is an awesome thing to aspire to the role of a deacon. It's an awesome thing to aspire to the role of an overseer, elder. Uh, but before we can do any of that, we have to be church members. None of the admonitions uh, on those who lead and minister in a church make a bit of sense unless there's actually a church to minister to. And, and we're going to be talking about that subject in the days ahead as the Apostle leads us in that direction. Uh, but for today, as we, as we conclude this, uh, I want us to remember how it is that we are made members in the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. You see, it starts when we admit that we are born in sin, that we are born dead in our trespasses and sin. That's where it starts. It starts when we humble ourselves and we agree with God when he says that we are sinners and that we face certain death. What does he say in, in, in the letter to the Romans? The wages of sin is death. But the grace of God, the grace of God is salvation in Jesus Christ. Amen? We are members of the local church because Christ broke his body and shed his blood in order to allow us to be those members in a local church. It's that that makes us saints, not all the good things that we think we might do in God's name. It's the fact that we have been redeemed, we have been bought out of our slavery, we have been justified, we have been transformed, we have been renewed, uh, we are a new creation, and all that because the Lord took and broke his body, and in place of that gave us his righteousness. And it's that that we remember even now in the next few minutes as we take to the table of the Lord. Um, Heavenly Father, I pray that we'll take these words from Scripture to heart. You are so gracious and merciful to us that as we preach your Bible faithfully, line by line, word by word, you carry us to the next thing that we need to know week by week. And so, Father, I pray that we will hear what you have written in that word, that, that we will live what you have written in that word, and that you will use those words in us and through us uh, to greatly grow this church, to magnify its ministry, to, to cause the spread of the gospel in, in this region, uh, to see new churches started because of our efforts, uh, to bless the tithes and offerings we bring into the storehouse so that we can do constantly more and more, to minister to those who need ministering and all the things 
that you've called us to do. And Father, I pray in fact, indeed, that you would lift up and build up and support those men that you have already called into uh, this church as deacons. And Father, that you would do likewise for those men in this church that you've called out to be elders and pastors. Let us stand faithful as Stephen was faithful on the gospel and on the whole counsel of the word of God. Father, now I pray as we prepare our hearts to take the table that we will in fact remember what it is that you've done for us, that, that your son died on that cross for our sins and that he rose again on the third day and all according to scripture. And Father, that you would grace us with your presence and with your power that we might go out and do there, there likewise as, as Stephen did in his world. Father, in Jesus' name we ask this for all the people in our hearing. Amen and amen.